A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, my name is Albi Mudise. I'm the head of communications at the Department of Environment, Forestry, and Fisheries. Uh, this morning, as we gathered here, as the whole world prepares to celebrate uh, World Fisheries Day on Saturday, the minister is uh, today joined by uh, panel members that uh, were constituted um, at around May or thereabouts. Um, by the minister to look at the, the uh, to review the management and conservation of species um, um, in South Africa, specifically with a focus on the on the sharks. Without much further ado, I'll say good morning and welcome, Minister of Environment, Forest and Fisheries, members of the panel that were announced at that time, stakeholders joining us uh, over here at the aquarium, and those of you joining us virtually. A very good morning and welcome. As it's uh, the custom, it's, uh, let's start the program with uh, the national anthem. I'll, I'm going to request that we all rise as we um, all are going to be led with the national anthem. Without much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me now invite uh, Jimmy Kanyile, who's going to lead us with the national anthem. Jimmy. Kosi Sigeleli Africa Malu pagan yisu pondo loyo Isa imitanda zo yetu go si sigelela tina lusa poloyo Mure na bulu kasi chaba sa Yesu, ufedi sedin tuali matswenye ho usi bulu ke u se bulu ke si chaba sa Yesu si chaba sa. South Africa, South Africa, a diplofan on se hema, a di deep tefan on se, orens oeve hehe bertes, varikan se antwort ye. Sound the call to come together. In united we shall stand. So let's live and strive for freedom in South Africa. Thank you, thank you. As we live and strive for freedom in South Africa, our land. Um, once again, good morning and welcome. Uh, let me invite uh, Sue Middleton to do the welcome and introduction. Sue Middleton is the Acting Deputy Director General who responds to the Portfolio of Fisheries Management. Sue? Honorable Minister, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, I would like to welcome you all uh, here today to this event to commemorate World Fisheries Day. And I would also like to extend a special um, word of welcome to those of you who joined us on quite short notice. We, we appreciate the, the effort. Also, um, we are obviously in the midst of COVID and there is a new way of doing things. Um, as you can see, we are all socially distanced. We have reduced the number of guests that this um, venue can take. And we also have a number of guests and some of the panelists joining us um, virtually online. 
So a welcome to those of you who couldn't be with us in the venue today, but thank you for taking the time to join us um, virtually. As we've already mentioned, um, today, uh, in commemoration of World Fisheries Day, which takes place on Saturday, the 21st of November, the Honourable Member, uh, the Honourable Minister, will share with you the findings and recommendations of the expert panel that reviewed South Africa's National Plan of Action for Sharks. The full report, should you be interested, is going to be made available on the department's website, so please look out for it. We think you will find the report is quite comprehensive and provides an honest account of our accomplishments as a country, as well as our challenges. And the report is something we welcome because it will help us to keep doing the things that we are doing well and to improve on the areas where we have shortcomings. And we're very glad that some of our local experts were able to join us today. But let me introduce the, the panel, the composition of the international panel. Um, the panel consists of Dr. Andres Domingo from the National Directorate of Aquatic Living Resources in Uruguay essentially the equivalent of the fisheries department in Uruguay. Dr. Rishi Sharma from the Food and Agricultural Organization based in Rome. And then um, on the panel, Dr. Alison Koch, um, you can wave, um, from Sandparks. Professor um, Kerry Sink from our sister organization, Sanbi, the South African National uh, Biodiversity Bio Institute. Welcome, Professor Sink. Ms. Zintla Langer, who is not with us um, today. And Mrs. Sharika Singh uh, from our sister branch, Oceans in Coasts. Then we are being joined virtually um, online by uh, Mr. Sasa Piha my colleague in the fisheries branch, um, Dr. Charlene De Silva, right in the corner there, who's also from the fisheries branch and our shark expert. And um, she was the convener of the panel. And then um, the chair of the panel is Professor Dr. Sven Kerwith, uh, also from the, the fisheries branch. After the presentations, um, if we have time, we will take a few short questions. Um, but please bear in mind that this is, uh, today is just the introduction um, of the report and we will have further consultations with um, key stakeholders. So without wasting any more time, ladies and gentlemen, let me hand back to the program director to introduce the Honourable uh, Minister. I keep wanting to call you a member for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you uh, for the introduction and the, and the remarks um, by Acting DDG Sue Middleton. The Minister will lead us with a keynote address. Um, obviously, Minister announced the constitution of this panel and the report has been handed out to the minister and she will talk to some of the key thematic areas that emanated from the report. Minister? Thank you very much to our program director, Mr. Albi Modise, the Acting Deputy Director General of the Fisheries Management Branch, Ms. Sue Middleton, the Deputy Director General of the Oceans and Coasts Branch, Ms. Judy Beaumont, Professor Dr. Sven Kerwith, uh, the Chair of our esteemed panel, and all the panelists who are with us in the flesh here this morning, and also those 
who are joining us online. Representatives of the shark fisheries, shark cage diving and ecotourism operators, representatives of non-governmental organizations and conservation agencies, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me very great pleasure this morning to present the panel's findings and recommendations in recognition, as we have heard, of World Fisheries Day that is taking place on Saturday. This day is significant because it serves as an annual reminder of how South Africa is blessed with a wide range of fisheries resources, but also an important reminder that we have to sustainably manage and adequately protect the ecosystems that harbor these precious resources. It is therefore appropriate today that we launch the report from our panel of experts, led by Professor Dr. Sven Kerwith and the Fisheries Branch of the Department, to review South Africa's National Plan of Action for the Conservation and Management of Sharks. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this review was prompted by a number of concerns that were widely expressed in the public domain. First, of course, has been the disappearance of the great white sharks from our seas in recent times. This has had a devastating impact on the shark diving industry and caused immense disappointment to the many tourists who visit our shores with the intention of seeing this great ocean predator. The second issue of concern has been increasing conflict between those involved in consumptive and non-consumptive use of sharks. High-profile negative media coverage of this conflict has resulted in poor outcomes for both fishers and tourism operators. Fishers are also concerned that recent assessments of our two demersal shark species the smooth hound and the soup fin shark indicate that current use is unsustainable. Concern has also been expressed over the management and protection of sharks, with widespread reports of illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing that poses a long-term risk to biodiversity, species survival and the su sustainability of law-abiding fishing operators. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, our country is blessed with the most diverse and rich shark resources in the world. In fact, when it comes to variety, there are 188 species of sharks, rays, and shimmerers, and South Africa represents ranks amongst the top five nations when it comes to diversity of these species. Of these, around 30% are considered endemic and therefore occur nowhere else in the planet. In fact, I'm told that since the National Plan of Action was initiated in 2013, at least six new species have been discovered and the discovery of even more species is expected aided by our efforts to explore and monitor our ocean biodiversity. Globally, information on population status and the impact of fisheries on sharks is sparse, as sharks are mostly caught as bycatch and the management and conservation of sharks is therefore seriously hindered by lack of appropriate data. Here in South Africa, we know that 14% of our shark species are endangered or critically endangered. One species, the sawfish, has not been seen in our waters since 1999, and its disappearance can be ascribed to a combination of illegal gill netting, degeneration of estuarine habitat, and 
general neglect of protection activities. Unfortunately, regulation in this regard came in too late to save this particular species. Now, the loss of this iconic species from our waters must serve as a lesson to us of what can happen to others if we don't take ownership of our biodiversity. Shark fishing, in some form or another, is a long tradition in South Africa, with over 100 years of fishing in Western Cape fishing villages. Sharks have long represented a valuable source of, source of income for these communities. Across our fisheries, around 99 species of shark, ray, and shimmerers are caught. Of those, only 20 species are landed in considerable quantities of over 10 metric tons per year. The impact of fishing on the ocean's biodiversity is undeniable, and sharks are no exception. Many species produce few live young and cannot withstand unregulated fishing pressure. Fishing is but one anthropogenic impact on sharks. Plastic pollution in our oceans, a change in climate, and the resulting ocean acidification, in combination with the depletion of prey species, present some of the formidable challenges we face in sustainable management of sharks. South Africa is a signatory to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization Committee on the Fisheries Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. The FAO's Committee on Fisheries is an important forum where countries are able to discuss the management of their fish stocks and where global agreements and non-binding instruments governing fisheries are negotiated. In line with the principles of the Code of Conduct, in 1998, the committee developed the International Plan for Action for the Conservation and Management of Sharks, <clears throat> which aims to ensure the management of sharks and their long-term sustainable use. To achieve these goals, states are encouraged to adopt and implement a national plan of action for conservation and management. In line with the objectives of the IPOA, the South African National Plan of Action for Sharks, published in 2013, identifies actions that ought to be taken to improve conservation and management related to South African fisheries. This document recognizes the need to determine and implement harvesting strategies consistent with the principles of biological sustainability attained through scientifically-based management and consistent with a precautionary approach. Furthermore, it strives to identify and direct attention, in particular to vulnerable or threatened sharks, to minimize bycapture and to contribute to the protection of biodiversity and ecosystem structure and function. The document recognizes the potential of non-consumptive use through ecotourism activities. These aspects of utilization need to be explored so as to find an optimum balance between consumptive and non-consumptive use, maximizing benefits with low impact on the marine ecosystem. The Biodiversity Management Plan for Sharks, published in 2015, establishes action to improve the conservation status of sharks beyond fishing impacts, giving effect to international and regional conservation initiatives. In 2018, an internal review which our department conducted indicated good progress in classification and assessment, but less progress in monitoring populations and the development of overarching regulatory frameworks. Our external panel agreed with these findings of the internal assessment. However, our external panel has expressed some concern on the slow progress on action around data gathering and reporting, development of regulatory tools, and implementation of recommendations for sustainable management. 
There is also consensus that the plan was overly ambitious considering the limited human and financial resources available for implementation. Our panel of experts agreed that the plan needed more clarity on actions, prioritization, and measurable indicators. Accordingly, our panel has come up with five recommendations. The first area is effective communication and coordination from scientific evidence and advice to policy management, to policy and management action. So the panel urges timeliest feedback amongst units within the department, a significant shortening of the lag time between scientific advice and management action, and the transparent and rapid communication with stakeholders. The second area for attention is the development of measurable indicators to track the progress and completion of actions. These should include timelines and quantities, for example, the number of species assessments completed or the percentage of observer coverage achieved. Thirdly, the panel recommended that the ecosystem effects of fishing and spatial conservation and management measures need to be adequately covered in the plan. Emerging science demonstrates that local or regional area-based management can have positive impacts for shark populations and can reduce conflict between user groups. This calls for better coordination, communication, and a framework for identifying and reducing conflict. The fourth area for stronger focus is on illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, and improved monitoring and surveillance and enforcement of compliance. The increased use of illegal gill nets along the coast is an emerging threat. Monitoring, reducing, and optimizing shark bycatch in commercial fisheries should be a high priority. Increasing effort is needed to better monitor and manage recreational fisheries, which are currently not monitored or are inadequately regulated. The fifth and last area for attention is the use of technology to improve monitoring and evaluation of management actions and compliance with permit conditions. For example, electronic monitoring programs such as camera-based scientific observation schemes, state-of-the-art electronic vessel monitoring systems, utilization of drones for surveillance and compliance, and online submission and storage of catch and effort data within a modern cloud-based data system. In other words, the fourth industrial revolution needs to reach the shark fisheries sector. In a recent meeting with the panel and senior officials from our two branches, we have endorsed these recommendations. And the challenge now to our officials is to urgently process the report's findings so we can implement the recommendations. The assignment of responsibilities and timelines in the department in this regard has already started. So, uh, as a well-known brand of uh, trainers says, just do it. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, by way of conclusion, to express my very sincere thanks to our panel of experts who worked tirelessly over the last three months to provide us all with a comprehensive report on South Africa's current shark management actions. When one set up this panel, ladies and gentlemen, one thought that it would be many years before we heard from them again. And I want to say, Dr. Professor, I was really delighted when after three months I got told, here's your report. So ladies and gentlemen, the roadmap is clear. Now all we have to do is follow it. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Minister. Uh, we were equally concerned because of the lockdown, um, but obviously we have since realized that we are actually able to engage even though uh, physical contact was a bit difficult. Uh, those virtual engagements also helped in a big way. Um, we're going to take uh, presentations from panel members. Uh, we will, as you would have observed or realized from the program, we will now take a presentation from Charlene Da Silva, an address that will talk to a century of shark fishing in South Africa. Charlene? Um, morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm exceedingly pleased to be here to present on behalf of the shark panel in front of you all and the Honorable Minister. Um, a background into this information because I think it's important for us to understand a little bit of the fishery. Um, so shark fishing in South Africa has a very long tradition and it's occurred for over a hundred years. It was focused around Western Cape fishing villages, specifically Hans Bay, um, where, they spe where they actually targeted soupin for their shark li for the livers, which was used to produce synthetic vitamin A oil. Um, very soon after this fishery peaked, it collapsed, um, and it hasn't actually re recovered um, back to pre-war levels. So industrialized shark fishing only actually occurred in the, 19, in the, in the 1990s with um, the shark longline, which was actually at the time focused on large pelagi on, um, pelagic sharks and demersal shark, which eventually split into the demersal shark longline fishery and the um, pelagic sh shark longline fishery. But around the 2000s, with declining fish stocks, a lot of the different fisheries started, started targeting more and more, um, more and more sharks, specifically the line fishery. So if you can see this plot here, this is archival information we found from the Hans Bay Co-op. And you can see in green, these catches in Hans Bay was very, very, very high. And um, the, the yellow, the blue, and the orange shows you the traditional, the modern fisheries. And you can see it's never actually gotten as high as it used to be. So it's very clear that this stock collapsed very, very long ago. So I have listed all the fisheries here. Um, in fact, sharks are actually caught in 10 different fisheries in South Africa, and we have counted between around about 100 species of um, sharks, rays, and chimeras that are actually caught in South Africa. But I'm actually just going to focus on the main ones. Um, in, we don't have that much time. Um, so the first one here would be the demersal shark longline fishery. Um, one of the reasons we are here today, this is officially the only target fishery, um, shark fishery in South Africa. They are, operate mostly in the Eastern Cape with a TAE of six vessels. They target the shark at the top, the smooth hound, the soupfin, and a few others. Um, I'm very pleased to tell you today that um, they have just signed an MOU um, to do an electronic monitoring system, and we are actually implement, we, the cameras are going to be loaded any day soon, and it's very exciting because this pilot will be very, very unique. It'll be the first shark fishery with this kind of platform on it. So I'm not going to go into much detail with the commercial line fishery, um, but yeah, they, they catch about 300 to 400 species, and it is very important that we remember that sharks are very important for the socioeconomic well-being of these target fishery, and the commercial fish, line fishery has been catching sharks for a very long time. The beach and seine fishery um, used to catch a lot more sharks, so the catches used to be around about 700 tons, um, but we introduced permit conditions that reduce this, and for the most part, they're not allowed to keep sharks, except for the ones in False Bay that can retain the same ones as the um, commercial line fishery. The Bay of the Protection fishery is the KwaZulu-Natal Sharks Board, as you all know. This is not a fishery in its own right, but it's an honorable mention here because the data that's, that comes from that um, so it's so important. It's actually been used to actually for all the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN red listing, for all the big species, including white sharks and mako sharks, and it's a very unique little data set. Bycatch fishery is actually very important in South Africa because for the most part, these bycatch fisheries catch a lot more sharks than the target fishery, specifically the inshore and offshore trawl. They use bottom trawl um, that, and they target hake, uh, inshore and offshore hake, but they catch about 1,500 tons of sharks, including the soupin. Most of the sharks are not reported to species level, which is a problem. And then our pelagic fishery, our pelagic shark fishery that I mentioned before, has actually been recently been merged with the tuna um, fishery, and they use pelagic drifting long lines, which targets tuna species when they come up to feed at night um, and attracts the sharks in. They've got a large shark bycatch. 
Um, but the shark, the, pelagic lo lo uh, the large pelagic fishery is a very good example of how science and management and research, we all work together. And there's been a long-term plan between the previous um, NPOA and now to actually reduce shark catches in this fishery. And it started with um, the al amalgamation of, this, of the shark fleet into the tuna fleet with the um, precautionary upper catch limit of 2,000 tons. So that the fish, once the fishery catches the amount, the whole fishery would close. We also removed all the CITES appendix to listed species from the permissible list because we did not catch them in high numbers and we were very, very worried about those populations. We also removed, the, the, we prohibited the use of wire traces and that was specifically to reduce catches of large makos. Um, finning is absolutely prohibited in South Africa. All sharks need to be naturally uh, landed with the fins naturally attached and sharks are officially designated as bycatch in terms of so any shark, so if any vessel catches more than 60% um, of sharks on a trip, then the next quarter, no, per quarter, the next quarter they have to take an observer. So at these regional fisheries management organization which manage tuna, South Africa is always recognized in terms of its best pra practices and, and um, good data. So to have good management, science is very important and these feeds into each other. And there's a number of things that we need to know about the animals. Um, we need to know how they grow. We need to know how old they get. We need to know when they mature, when they start breeding, where they're pupping. We need to know about their genetics. Do we share stocks with Mozambique? We need to know if the, the, the sharks cross between the Indian and Atlantic Ocean. And this is a number of publications that we've done over the years. Ourselves and our friends at Oceans and Coast, um, there's been some work on climate change. And this is very important and we'll be continuing to do this and it's outlined in, th in the new NPOA, the kind of research that we need to do to make sure that our sharks are sustainably fished. So we were very fortunate for the last few years to have one of the to world's top stock assessment um, scientists working for us and he developed two models that could actually help us use help us assess our sharks. The first one is, is, a, is a difficult one for sharks because it is, it's actually only for de data rich species because it requires detail on the biology, it requires abundance data and very good catch data. And we were only actually able to run this for two species. So you can see that soup and shark stock assessment is very pessimis pessimistic. This is not surprising because recently this, this animal has been listed as critically endangered. Globally, there's not a single fishery that where this, the, where the stock is doing well. Um, so, this on the left here, you'll see it's, it's called the Kobe plot. It works on the traffic light system. Basically, the bottom axis gives you a biomass in relation to the biomass if it was sustainable, and the fishing level on the, on the y axis, the fishing le level in relation to what would be sustainable. And basically, anything in the green, the, the biomass is okay, and the fishing pressure is okay. If it's in the orange, the biomass is okay. Sorry but the fishing, <laughs> fishing mission is too high. And then as you can see it in the, in the red, um, that's not where you wanna be. So for the soup fin, you can see it starts off with a little square and you can see a historical decline into the red zone. And then what this model does is it gives you a, a, a percentage probability of this animal actually falling into one of those category. And you can see that there's absolutely no doubt that this animal is in trouble. So a further, um, feature of this model is that it projects this, projects this fishing data forward in time at various catch levels. And as you can see, at the current catches of between 200 and 300 tons, this animal will be commercially extinct in 10 to 20 years. Um, but if we follow the scientific recommendations that trying to reduce catches to below 100 tons, we will actually be able to recover the stock in the long term. But sh with sharks, we don't really ever have data. And um, the second model was developed to deal with data poor species. And this model is very, very special because it's now being used to inform IUC assessment of all global sharks. You'll see they've just recently listed hundreds of sharks on, on the IUCN list, and all of them use this model. The example here today is an endemic species of skate, the, um, the yellow spotted skate. Um, and this, it actually uses data from our abundance surveys, which, it, which is pretty good. Um, and it, we used it so from the Afrikaner survey. But the nice thing about this model is you can actually use any abundance data. You just need two points in time, and the model actually fills in the middle for you. And as you can see in the first plot, we have a declining population trend of this model. 
Then it translates this data into the IOCN categories. And here you can see that it, the peak very much falls into this orange, which shows you a 49.7 chance of this animal falling into the endangered category. So this informs the IOCN rest, red list assessment, and it also informs us to see which one's in trouble. And fortunately, we had enough data to actually do 21 assessments of sharks, skates, skates and chimeras, and this is unheard of. Um, so we were able to rerun these and keep, uh, keep an eye on our stocks. Um, so, as I've said, we have 100 years of fishing, and it seems like a lot, but globally it isn't. Um, it's a drop in the bucket to some countries, and we have a lot of species that are impacted by fisheries, but very few of them are actually in very big trouble, and it gives us a good opportunity with the recommendations that was put together by the shark panel to actually improve our science, which improves our management, and hopefully we will be able to sustain the socioeconomic well-being of our fishers in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for that insightful uh, presentation, Dr. Shalinda Silva. Dr. Da Silva uh, has been uh, the convener of this panel of experts, uh, of course, uh, drawn from our fisheries management branch, and that's when policy interfaces with science, or is it science and policy interface, so as to ensure that uh, policy making is uh, driven and dictated by, by science. Without much further ado, I'd like to now invite uh, Dr. Alison Koch from Sandpax, who has also been part of this panel of experts. Dr. Koch? On the uh, shark biodiversity in South Africa and the assessment and planning to support special management. Doc. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning. Good morning, Honorable Minister, colleagues, friends, members of the public, and members of the media. I've been very proud to be part of this process, um, to work with the panel members, to work closely with the department, and to have an opportunity to help secure the future of our sharks and rays in South Africa. It's been a very rewarding experience, and I've learned a lot about the different sectors of the fisheries, um, in addition to the biodiversity and conservation side of shark fisheries. So today, what I'm going to be talking about is the disappearance of white sharks from False Bay and Hans Bay, and looking at the two prominent theories that have been put forward to explain this disappearance. Namely, the presence of a pair of orcas that are shark specialists and have started hunting large coastal sharks, and the second theory being the decline of the soupfin sharks and the smoothhound sharks, specifically targeted by the demersal shark fishery, which could be to blame. First of all, I want to acknowledge that this is a work in process. We have examined the available evidence as it is at the moment. We still have a lot to learn. There's still a lot of questions outstanding. But by working together, we can hopefully um, learn more through how fishy, fishing is impacting our ecosystems. But I do also want to acknowledge that my scientist colleagues have allowed me to present data to you today that has not been published yet. And I really want to thank them. They are acknowledged in the slides as I go through them. I want to thank them for allowing me to do that so that we can provide some clarity on this issue of white shark disappearance, which has had a devastating impact on white shark tourism. Before I get started into looking at those two theories, it's important to realize that white shark movements are very diverse and they are very complex. This is a map of more than 30 satellite tagged white sharks tagged in the Western Cape, and this shows their tracks across the Southwest Indian Ocean, some into the Southern Ocean. It shows that they are present coastally and also offshore. It also shows us that these white sharks that we tagged in South Africa spend a lot of time in our neighboring countries, uh, Mozambique, Madagascar, and we have found that there are lots of patterns to these movements. We have found seasonal patterns, we have found cyclical patterns in terms of years, um, individual patterns as well, and we've also identified a lot of drivers of these movements. 
We know that um, environmental conditions play a role, so for example, water temperature. We know that prey availability plays a role. Um, we know that uh, the life history stage of these sharks plays a role. So for example, males and females and adults and juveniles use the ocean very differently. We also probably haven't identified some of the drivers of, this, um, of these movements. It's an ongoing process. But today, what I'm talking about is not these patterns, although we have to keep these in mind. What I'm talking about is the relatively recent decrease and steep decrease in extended absence of white sharks from two out of these areas, namely Falls Bay and Hans Bay. This graph shows you the white shark occurrence at three of the main aggregation sites in South Africa, namely False Bay, Hans Bay, and Mossel Bay. These are shark sightings per unit effort. And what you are seeing there, the black line represents the shark sightings per unit effort. The gray line represents the uncertainty and the variability around these sightings. The blue color represents a statistically significant increase, and the red color represents a statistically significant decrease. And what you can immediately see there, um, with false bay at the top and Hans bay in the middle, that in the uh, beginning stages of the monitoring data, there's a significant increase, and then at the end of the monitoring period, there's been a, a detectable decrease. Um, but not all sites in South Africa have had white sharks disappear. So for example, in Mossel Bay, um, that decline has not been detected. And in fact, there's been a significant increase in the chance of seeing white sharks in Mossel Bay. So I want to illustrate that the disappearance hasn't been across the whole of South Africa and across the whole white sharks range. It's been from False Bay and Hans Bay. We also have regular sightings coming in from Plettenberg Bay and Algoa Bay over the last few years and months. So let me get into the first theory, the presence of a pair of killer whales nicknamed Port and Starboard. And I'm sure many of you have heard of them already. In 2017, five white shark carcasses washed up on the coastal shores of Hans Bay. Each carcass had a huge open wound in between its pectoral fins, it had its liver removed, and some of the carcass had very distinct rake or tooth marks on the body or the pectoral fins of these sharks. There were these five in 2007, and then there was another one in 2020. It's also important to remember that a lot of these sharks, or, or, or sharks probably didn't wash up, that were killed because sharks, when they do die, they usually sink. It was a combination of oceanic conditions that pushed them up on shore. We also know that not all white sharks or all killer whales have the same impact. Not all killer whales eat large sharks. So not all killer whales probably have the same impact on sharks. But what we do know is that this pair of orcas have been recorded predating on seven gill sharks, white sharks, and most recently, bronze whaler sharks as well. This is data from Hans Bay. And what you have here is the here on the X axis, and you've got your uh, white shark sightings on the Y axis. Um, first of all, I just want to point out that on the second Y axis, you've got the sea surface temperature. This has been relatively constant in Hans Bay over this monitoring period and is unlikely to explain this huge um, pattern that we see here in the white shark sightings, where it starts off um, around 2010 increasing. Um, there's a lot of variability um, over the years, and then there's a very steep decline starting in 2017. And this is when the first uh, uh, carcasses of white sharks were uh, washed up, um, and it coincided with that. However, as we all know, correlation doesn't always equal causation. So we needed to take a closer look at what was happening here with um, this trend. Uh, so what you have here is um, us zooming in on the data with the graph on the left-hand side. 
Um, and this is from 2017 to 2018. The gray dots are the shark sightings per, year, per trip, and um, the red lines are where the shark carcasses um, were found. Each and every time that white shark carcasses washed up on the beaches, this pair of orcas was recorded in the area. Those wounds were very distinct, showing orca predation. And each and every time that this happened, there was an immediate drop and gap in white shark sightings. Each and every time. And this, as you can see with the data, leads to a general um, decline in sightings over the period. The story of the bronze whaler sharks, which is the dots in blue, is another story altogether, and not one I have time for um, today. When we look at the sightings of this pair of orcas in South Africa, I've got two graphs here. The first one shows you the number of sightings over the different years. They were first sighted in South Africa in 2013, and the sightings have increased in frequency um, over the years. The second thing I want to demonstrate is that most of the sightings have happened in False Bay and in Khans Bay, with only one shark, one killer whale pair sighting in Mossel Bay and very few up the East Coast. This might explain why we are seeing the disappearance of white sharks from False Bay and Khans Bay, but we're not seeing the same disappearance from Mossel Bay and other aggregation sites up the East Coast. I also want to point out that colleagues from the United States have documented significant impacts of killer whales at other aggregation sites around the world. So for example, in the Farallon Islands in California, it's a well-known established white shark aggregation site. The scientists there have documented uh, orca predation on white sharks. And they have shown with a long-term data set that when killer whales come into the aggregation site at the Farallon Islands, the white sharks flee the area almost immediately, and they relocate to another aggregation site further away. This impact can be up for months and sometimes even a year that they've documented at this aggregation site. Furthermore, the first uh, reports of this pair of orcas actually comes from predating on seven gill sharks, which is also another large predatory shark reaching up to three meters um, from False Bay. And there was a very well-known aggregation site at Miller's Point in False Bay. And what we documented there, we were fortunate to have many of these animals tagged, these sharks tagged. And what we found was that when we found shark carcasses, which had been predated on by killer whales. We also saw the same pair of killer whales when we found the carcasses. Um, we had distinct tooth marks on these. Um, the rest of the tagged sharks that were in the area at the time fleed the site within 24 hours. And we have documented this more than three times at this site. At this point, this site has all been but abandoned. Go back slightly. So, collectively, at this stage, with the available information that we have, the evidence supports the theory that this pair of orca whales is significantly impacting the presence of white sharks in False Bay and in Khans Bay. I now want to touch and talk about the, the second theory, which is whether the disappearance of white sharks is related to the decline in the soupfin sharks and the smooth hounds, um, specifically by the demersal shark longline fishery. Charlene has already introduced you to this graph. And what I want to say up front once again is that soupfins are now listed as critically endangered. The decline of this population is clear, and urgent intervention is needed and is one of the recommendations that we have made. But that is an issue in its own right. In the context of this debate, when we look at where the white sharks disappear, you see that the disappearance of the white sharks from False Bay and from Hans Bay 
um, oh, uh, the, the, the steep decline of the superfund population precedes this disappearance by several decades. It's not the pattern we would expect to see if they were the cause. If we zoom in on the demersal shark longline data, and we have a look at the catching effort across the provinces, on the left-hand side, you've got the catches and the effort of smoothhound sharks and superfund sharks from the Eastern Cape, and on the right-hand side, from the Western Cape. And what you can see, first of all, is that the effort is much higher on the Eastern Cape, where we still see white sharks, and lower in the Western Cape, where the white sharks have disappeared from these two sites. Another thing we looked at is we went, wanted to determine what the proportion of superfund sharks and smoothhound sharks had in the diet of white sharks. And basically, we wanted to see the relative importance of these two species in their diet. We only have good stomach content data from the KZN shark nets, where over 200 animals were dissected. In that data, more than 40 different species of prey were found in the stomach contents of those white sharks. There's a huge shark component, so sharks are very important in the diet of white sharks. But interestingly, on the, list, on the left is a list of the shark species found um, and recorded in these samples. And very interestingly, there isn't a single record of a smooth hound or a superfund shark in the stomach content data that we have. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that white sharks would not eat superfund sharks and smoothhound sharks. But if they were such a large component of their diet, causing them to abandon two big aggregation sites, one would expect to see at least a few records. And furthermore, in the False Bay area and in the Hans Bay area, we know that Cape fur seals are a very important component of the white shark's diet. In the animals that we have dissected, that have opportunistically washed up along our shores, the most abundant and common item were seals. And in one example, which is the uh, photograph in the top there, um, one shark had six full seals inside of its stomach. Seal populations are relatively stable in False Bay and Hans Bay, and they are read readily available. In addition, there are other coastal resources also read readily available to white sharks, schools of yellowtail, schools of squid, other predatory fish. So the question is, if these resources are still available, why would not some white sharks still take advantage of them? And I put it to you that the evidence suggests and supports the fact that they are avoiding these areas because they are afraid and they have um, predation risk in these areas, likely from these orcas. The evidence does not support that the disappearance, this abrupt and sudden disappearance of white sharks is as a result of the decline of two specific species. And as I mentioned right up front, this is a work in process. Scientists have allowed me to use this information, and it hasn't even been published yet. It's part of their PhD program, so I thank them again. We still don't have all the answers, and therefore, we have further recommendations. We do need to investigate the ecosystem effects of fishing, specifically on top predators. And this is being um, uh, included in the recommendations for the review of the NP NPOA. We need more investigation on the diet, and the coastal resource use of white sharks in the Western Cape and the identification of these drivers of movement. This debate has polarized many people, and it's caused some divisions amongst colleagues and friends. And I want to put to you today that now is the time that we need to pull our data, we need to pull our resources, we need to get the fishermen and the scientists and the managers working together so that we can better understand the ecosystem and the impacts um, of, these, um, uh, of, of the system. Um, we also need to better understand the killer whale occurrence, diet, and the impact they have on the ecosystem as well. 
So thank you very much for listening. Thank you again for this opportunity to present on the panel. And thank you for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alison Koch, um, weighing in on the disappearance of the white sharks. I had erroneously referred to the shark biodiversity, which is the next presentation. Um, and that one will be led by Professor Kerry Sink, focusing in on the shark biodiversity in South Africa and the assessment and planning to support special management. Prof. Good morning, Minister, colleagues. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share some of Sanby's perspectives on shark biodiversity. It's been a pleasure working with this panel and learning from them. I lead South Africa's national biodiversity assessment for the marine realm. This is something Sanby does every five to seven years to report on the state of biodiversity. And one of the critical underpinnings of that is our map of marine ecosystem types. We've got 150 marine ecosystem types currently recognized in the country. We focus at this level because of the overwhelming diversity of species that's reflected in our shark biodiversity. So at the moment, I'm busy nesting these 150 marine ecosystem types into 14 functional ecosystem groups to align with the IUCN's new efforts to develop a global ecosystem typology. And what's really clear as I, I work through many of the visual surveys that I've been involved in, which help us to classify and map South Africa's incredible oceans, you really see that we have sharks in all of our ecosystem types, from the back of the shores where the eagle rays are, are moving down, incredible shark diversity on the continental shelf, the slope, and into the abyss. And then, of course, many of our, our large open ocean predators traveling those liquid highways. As Minister pointed out, about a third of our sharks are endemic, and that's really reflecting our three ocean systems. And we get so many benefits from this incredible shark biodiversity. We've heard about our, our shark fisheries, we've heard about, we, we know that our fishing grounds are part of what we call our ecological infrastructure, critical for food and job security. But we are also aware that non-consumptive use of sharks can provide benefits for tourism. The National Biodiversity Assessment does have a look at the species level, relying heavily on, on the IUCN assessments and the clever stock assessment biologists that was at DAF, uh, before that was at Sanby, where he really helped us to fast track IUCN red list assessments. Um, the thing that stands out in the shark red listing is that broadband, the brown bar of data deficiency. So indeed across all the realms, it is the marine realm that has the highest data deficiency, which just reflects how much more we have to learn. And there's a similar pattern for uh, marine, for our state of our stocks. So even though we have sophisticated stock assessment, we aren't able to do that in detail for the many species that are affected by fishing. So we rely on these other methods to track our biodiversity. One of these is the ecosystem threat assessment. And we see that half of South Africa's marine ecosystem types, and particularly those types of limited extent, like the little patches of muds, and some of the localized gravel and other habitats on, on our shelf edges are more threatened. The good news from the National Biodiversity Assessment was our progress in protection levels. Um, last year, you will recall that South Africa declared 20 new marine protected areas. Um, so if you look at those two maps on the right-hand side, you can really see the progress of so the increase in green, the progress in our protection levels. So, we had the first protection for 51 ecosystem types. And in there, uh, first protection for many of our deep water sharks. By way of example, um, up there against the Namibian border, the orange shelf edge new marine protected area plays a key role in protecting some of our demersal sharks, the small benthic ones. Um, 
And also, this is zoned as a sanctuary zone, so providing protection for some of the pelagic species like this blue shark. The Gallus Bank Complex, an area of high endemism. A lot of our species that are only found in South Africa occur here. And um, for those of us who've had the privilege to visit this area, there's a kelp forest on top of a pinnacle that descends into a garden of lace corals and sea fans. And on the baited underwater video, we find many, many sharks and rays in this particular area. The Southwest Indian Seamount is two, two areas on our continental slope, and actually our fearless leader, Dr. Professor Kerwath, he helped us um, in the work to design this marine protected area network. He was one of the scientists giving inputs over 13 years ago when that work started, and he was able to provide some data to help decision-making here and showing that this protected area makes a contribution to protection of the nursery area for our mako sharks. The Port Elizabeth Corals um, Marine Protected Area is one of my favorites. It's like this long, 40 kilometer long, 500 meter tall pinnacle that runs offshore of Port Elizabeth. Um, incredible richness of life in this area. And we've seen for the first time some of our deep water sharks. So although we might have seen them on a trawl deck or, or caught in fisheries, for the first time we saw the African chimera in this area and our, our prickly or sleeper sharks. The Amatola offshore marine protected area of East London is one that protects our, what we like to call the underwater fan boss. So these small, low growth lace corals and sea fans um, only found in South Africa, very localized ecosystem type. But the elasmobranch diversity in this marine protected area is actually outstanding. Um, Sven also led the ACEPAMIDA project, which enabled us to see the very first, get the first images of the oscillated guitar shark. Um, and this protected area just amazed us in terms of the diversity of sharks, rays, and chimeras. The Protea Banks Marine Protected Area in KwaZulu-Natal, we call it the Shark Park, is, is one that really shows the value of strongly considering shark tourism um, and weaving in specific goals into your protected area design. So not just about protecting, but about supporting the tourism economy. And other protected areas, um, similarly in Natal, making these kind of contributions. Protea Banks, when, when we first identified this area through large spatial analyses, I didn't actually know this area really well um, because it kind of came out of a sophisticated layer of maps with 500 layers of biodiversity features and a lot of social and economic data. But when we went there, I was amazed to learn that this is the one, the only place in the world that's a gathering place for giant guitar sharks. And so um, it shows the role of protected areas in, in supporting key life history areas for, for these groups of species. The Tugela Banks, Alawal Shoal, and Isimangaliso, also the first sightings of, of some of the sharks, the rarer cat shark species. And um, of course, Isimangaliso protecting many of the more tropical Indian Ocean species. So we've got the Atlantic Ocean, the Southern Ocean, the Indian Ocean and all that diversity in our protected area network. Five of the key findings um, of the National Biodiversity Assessment speak to these five priority actions, which are all things that were picked up in the work that the panel did. First one's about modernizing and integrating data collection, and Minister spoke about the fourth industrial revolution. We need to embrace that not only for fisheries, but for biodiversity data too the development and implementation of fisheries management plans. So South Africa would really do well to have fisheries management plans that have targets for the ecosystem effects um, and habitat protection goals for sharks and rays. All of the panel members have been reflecting on cooperative governance and improved coordination. It's also tracked in the National Biodiversity Assessment the importance of effective communication, of recognizing and articulating the benefits from our, our beautiful shark biodiversity. And then the key research to address the knowledge gaps. We need those data deficiencies need attention. 
So looking ahead, um, one of the other priority actions is to apply the coastal and marine critical biodiversity area map. So South Africa produced this map last year, and there's, um, it's been in, in a series of iterative improvements have been planned. And we really need to make sure that our, our shark data feeds into this plan because it's not strong on species data right now. It has a more ecosystem uh, focus. We need those important life history areas I was talking about to feed into the plan and then stronger red list assessments. So it's where we can work together to, to prioritize our shark species. And these kind of initiatives can, can give us science-based spatial planning. But importantly, the success of all of this spatial planning work really depends on the human dimensions. And so what we need is a robust and inclusive stakeholder process. Um, this was important in, in, in providing a foundation to our, our recent expansion of protected areas and, and is going to be very important in taking marine spatial planning and marine protected areas forward in South Africa. Um, and so just to say that um, if we're able to do this, have robust and inclusive stakeholder arrangements um, and consultation processes, good cooperation between departments, then we will be able to secure not only our shark biodiversity, but our healthy oceans and all their benefits for current and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, um, Prof. Kersink, uh, for weighing in on the shark biodiversity in South Africa. I would like now to invite Sakira Singh, who will lead us on the SA Sharks Resources, Balancing Conservation and Commercial Use. Good day, everybody. Um, thanks again for everybody taking the time to attend this um, little meeting. Thank you to all the members of the panel and other honorable minister. Um, I'm tasked today with trying to discuss or elucidate balancing conservation and use within the resources that we have as far as sharks. South Africa is globally regarded as a hotspot for shark biodiversity uh, with its species richness and at high levels of endemism, it has an intrinsic conservation value. So as a resource, it has an intrinsic um, conservation value, ecological value. Further to this, we have a commercial value associated with shark biodiversity as a resource. And this can be either extractive, uh, which Charlene has taken you through in, in the form of fisheries, or non-extractive, which I'm going to try to discuss as far as tourism. The important key message on this is that in order to um, sustainably manage shark biodiversity as a resource, we require a level of balance across user groups. So uh, in South Africa, um, shark tourism is generally either species focused or areas focused. The main reason behind this is because there are different assemblages of species across the coastline. But over and above that, um, in order to offer a um, valid interaction or experience, there's a certain density or number of species that you need to have to be able to regularly provide sightings and experiences. Um, many of you are very familiar with white shark cage diving. It is one of the oldest forms of tourism, directed shark tourism in the country, and is quite well established. It's now been spread over a number of locations between the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape. Some of the lesser known uh, opportunities to view sharks are uh, within the kelp forests in uh, the Western Cape, uh, cow sharks, pajama sharks, and some of the endemic shy sharks have become a um, specific target for directed tours uh, on scuba and snorkel. We have an emerging offshore pelagic dive industry which is focused on um, mako sharks and blue sharks, and that occurs around Cape Point. If we move into the Eastern Cape, the annual sardine run is a um, event, and its associated predators form 
a directed tour opportunity for the Eastern Cape. Um, as Kerry is elucidated to, in KZN, we have Protea Banks and Aliwal Shoal, which are world-renowned dive sites, specifically because of the number of species that you are able to view at any given time. These include tiger sharks, Zambezi sharks, black tip sharks, um, and other carcharinid species. And as we move further north during the summer months, uh, high densities of manta ray and whale shark allow directed tourism to occur. So uh, most of these engage in different activities to make them more accessible. So if you think about a tourism experience, it means you are guaranteed a sighting, you are guaranteed an interaction. And to do so, people, um, tour operators, uh, undertake various activities that assist with creating this experience. For instance, shark cage diving or scuba and snorkel. Uh, cages offer more safety and protection and make it more accessible, whereas scuba diving creates a more intimate interaction between the animal and the tourist. Some are shore-based, some are boat-based, depending on accessibility. But um, in general, it's reliant on having sharks being drawn in and being in contact with the public or making them accessible. So there are two types of drawing in sharks. There are natural aggregations that occur as part of normal life history patterns, like ragged tooth sharks at the bottom, um, which aggregate during mating and gestation periods. Or you have natural aggregations focused around feeding events, like the sardine run. The other mechanism of attracting animals into proximity for viewing is the use of chum, which is quite contentious. Chumming involves the scenting and or um, baiting of animals into a proximity of a boat or area to allow and facilitate an extended interaction between a tourist and the animal. So obviously, all of these different activities have some kind of impact. Um, and within the department, we are tasked with being able to, as far as possible, mitigate these impacts. Um, there are various instruments under the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act that allow us to um, regulate tourism within South Africa. White shark cage diving regulations have been around since uh, 1998 in various forms and have been recently reviewed and published. Um, we also use spatial restriction, so spatial management of user groups, like declaration of MPAs or special use areas. There's the TOPS, uh, Threatened and or Protected Species Regulations under NEMBA, which allow us to give specific protection to species for either conservation reasons or user group reasons. Other legislation involves restricting activities that are um, considered potentially detrimental, uh, like chumming, and restricting them to certain areas or to certain user groups. So um, I've been asked to give some examples of the department's intervention in user group conflict. Um, and so this is the first one. Uh, during 2009 to 2012, False Bay experienced a peak in shark attacks. Um, and this was generally thought to be linked to white shark cage diving activity within the Seal Island in False Bay. After engagement with municipal government, it became clear that beach tourism was seriously being impacted and bather safety was a major concern. Uh, within this context, we had to come to a resolution on how to engage to make, to provide some kind of in, in, input on how to move forward with the issue. So um, after engagement with the city of Cape Town, um, bather safety specialists from the Natal Sharks Board, Life Saving Association, and the, bather, the, the beach tourism industries, uh, it was discussed that an um, intervention that could be viewed as the department trying to resolve the issue 
involved diminishing the amount of charm that uh, operators were using within the Fault Bay area, but over and above that, discussions led to uh, bather safety mitigation measures, including the shark spotters program. And um, development of the local life-saving clubs to be able to deal and the deploy of a exclusion net. Okay. The second example would be um, the cow shark, which is a popular aggregating species within the kelp forests. Um, the species is not exactly very commercial viable for fishermen because it's the meat is of a poor quality and it doesn't really have fins. So basically the only market for it was for the liver and the oil. After discussion with the um, fishing industry and the department's fisheries group, it was, con it was decided and or uh, agreed to that this species be deregulated from extractive use and be put onto a non-consumptive use species. The final one that we've had, the most recent conflict that we've had to intervene with is the spatial overlap between the commercial line fishes and the white shark cage diving operators in Khan's Bay. The area of contention is this little piece of reef in the middle where um, commercial line fishers were fishing large bronze whaler sharks uh, in close proximity to the white shark cage diving operators. Obvious conflict occurred and discourse which elevated it to a level where the department had to intervene. After significant engagement with stakeholders in the early portions of this year and or iterations of potential um, mitigation measures between the panel members and scientists, there was agreement reached that there would be measures implemented through permit conditions that would spatially separate both user groups and minimize conflict. In addition to this, an existing slot limit of the size of animals that they were able to catch would be implemented through permit conditions for the recreational, uh, for the commercial fishermen. And within the cage diving, a move off rule of 15 meters uh, from the cage diving boats. Okay. So again, coming back to the panel, the key message being coordination, communication, and this is very, very important in the sense that um, the task team itself is an example of what coordination can do. Bringing specialists from different areas together and creating a, a platform for us to interact and or um, brainstorm um, feedback mechanisms for issues that are occurring. Over and above that, we need to strengthen the link between research and management. Um, this is significant, as Alison's demonstrated in her talk. Uh, when, we di when we discuss conflict resolution, we need answers to support the decisions that we make. Thank you. Thank you for, for that presentation. Um, Shar Sarika, we uh, almost towards the end of our program, but uh, obviously we had uh, allowed for some questions to be deposited for further engagement, but also to allow some of the members that are here to, to also raise some questions. There, there are questions that have been sent through. I, have, I hope that uh, we, we will get uh, panel members to respond to them. Um, the first question was whether the recording will be made available. Yes, indeed, we are recording the whole session. It will be made available for members of the media who may want to access it later, just for accuracy. Um, the Nick Walsh sent a number of questions. Will the scientific data by the expert panel be made available? I think Sue has already spoken to that when he sp she spoke earlier about uh, the report. Various conservation and research companies' data over the last five years were not asked for. Nick asks why. Um, taking consideration socioeconomic research and data submitted to your department, when will you create a shark sanctuary 
in the small areas dedicated to shark cage diving area? That's the question. Okay. Panel members? Yes. That's fine. The first question on, on the availability of data. Um, so the department's data, department's um, fisheries data is available to the public because it's, it's the public's data. So data underlying, um, for example, our stock assessments, they are publicly available together with the analysis. Um, the second question on data from, from um, private companies that uh, conduct research. Um, we generally don't ask for data, but we welcome the public um, to provide us with information. So if there are data streams available, then um, we'd like um, these, these organizations to partner up with us, and then we can consider together these data streams. But we also have to bear in mind that um, data needs to be independent in a way, and it needs to be verified. And to, to the third question on the socioeconomic um, research data um, and the, the conservation data towards the establishment of a shark sanctuary, sanctuary yeah. um, well, I, I might want to hand this over to Sarika. So as I understand it, the question was with regard to um, the tourism areas for white shark cage diving and whether they would be yeah. uh, so considered as a sanctuary. Yeah, take into consideration socioeconomic research and data submitted to your department. When will you create shark sanctuary in the small areas dedicated to shark, shark cage diving? Okay, there's, there's the first portion of that would be that we do collect socioeconomic and environmental data from existing uh, tourism operations. So there is a continual updating of socioeconomic information and or um, ecological information that can be sourced from our uh, operators that we are permitting. Um, this is continually updated and informs the process, including policy revisions of the white shark cage diving and regulations associated with it. As far as sanctuary areas, um, this has been a difficult situation, especially with the Hans Bai um, example that I've given. Um, while this is a historical fisheries area, it also is a very distinct um, ecological site um, as far as the densities of white sharks or historic densities of white sharks in the area. So yes, um, separation of user groups by spatial segregation, either creation of sanctuaries, is something that we have put some consideration into. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Zakira, for Sarika rather, for that intervention. Any questions from the floor? The, yes, Minister. I think the point about the creation of any sanctuary is that it's similar to the creation of any marine or any land protected area. There is, a, there is a regulatory process that has to be gone through. And I think that once one has collated the, the data, consideration can be given to that process. But all different stakeholders who are currently using those areas for different use will have to be consulted. So it's not a, it's not a simple or quick fix solution because it is governed by particular regulatory processes. And I think that that's what uh, is important for everybody to understand. And what those regulatory processes aim to do is to manage the balance of use and the conservation interests. Thank you, Minister. Um, from the floor, there's a hand over there. The mic is coming your way. Um, I'll stay seated. What, it's, it's hard to explain how the, the amount of science directed at sharks has improved. About 15 years ago, Charlene will remember, at, at when 
fishers had a meeting with, with uh, fisheries, we'd leave a chair empty to say, this is for your absent shark scientist that you're obliged to appoint. And that was 15 years ago, and now we have this, this uh, spectacular um, sort of advancement in the amount of effort put into shark research. Um, the one difficulty that, that we still have in the industry is that um, you mentioned that we should be looking at um, transparent and rapid communication. Um, and at the moment, communication with fisheries is basically non-existent. Um, we had a, a recreational working group meeting where shark, recreational shark fishers will discuss issues. That's been shut down. Um, we, the guys in the, in the hand, shark hand line have no idea what's going to happen when you um, take the, the amount of effort out of the sector. Um, the, we don't know, a, there are potentially very valuable um, new fisheries with sharks, but um, there's currently a moratorium on any new fisheries. So there's a, a sort of a, a lack of co co cohesion between what's planned and what's actually happening at the moment. So um, I, I'm not sure how, that, how one can bridge that gap. That's the one concern. And in 2015, at the uh, uh, Shark Biodiversity Management uh, meeting across the way, one of the biggest challenges was, um, was funding. And um, if I understand correctly, about 95 million has been taken from fisheries to go to SAA. Um, and we're worried um, if, you, if you lose that money, um, w w you know, what impact will it have on shark research when already 2015 we, 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 um, fisheries said we're running low on cash? Your name, sir? Your name? Can I take that one, Albi? Yes, Minister. Okay. So part of the reason why we are trying to, why we are launching this report publicly is that we are absolutely aware that when you undertake research of this nature, there will be concerns from industry, there will be concerns from the environmental sector, there will be concerns from the uh, tourism sector as to how will this, the findings of this report be implemented and how will, they be, how will they be implemented in a way that balances the needs of different sectors? So I think that what we are trying to do in fisheries and in all other aspects of the department is to correct a, a situation where things may have been perceived to have been done in secret. We don't want to do that. So what we, all we're sharing with you today is, here's the research, here's what the, the research is saying. And I think what we all understand is that we want industries, all industries, whether those are consumptive or non-consumptive industries that create jobs, we want to sustain those industries and we want to sustain the jobs that they support. What we've got to do, as we've had to do in other fisheries, is to sit down with the industry and say, if aspects of your stock are depleted, how do we work together to restore stock levels? And we've done that very successfully in the deep sea hake trawl where we had to take some hard decisions over a few years that have had infinite benefit in the current situation. So uh, when we finished, here's my card. You are welcome to have it. You can write me a letter. Um, I drive everybody sitting at this desk crazy because I have a very old-fashioned idea. My mother said to me, when people write to you, you must reply. Uh, so it's quite irritating, but quite good for you. Um, I'll reply to your letter. But what your presence here is indicating is your family, and we have to solve this problem together, not secretly. All of government is facing budget challenges and budget cuts. Uh, and all of us have spent a year dealing with the fallout of the pandemic. Uh, one of my secret skills is I used to run finance in Gauteng, so I know the odd thing or two about budgeting. And together with 
our very excellent management team, we've been working our way around these budget cuts so that we can do the work that we have to do in order that those of you who have an interest in the work that we do should get the products that you need. So all I'm trying to say is uh, we are going to work on this and any other difficult problem that confronts us in this department in a consultative manner and as a team. Uh, and we just, uh, we're asking you to come to the party because as industry, you don't want to see these species going extinct any more than we do. So I hope that, uh, I can't say that there may not be pain. Uh, we're all adults, life is full of pain. But the point is, can we, through that pain, ultimately get better outcomes? And we're not going to do that secretly or behind your back. We're going to do it with you, in consultation with you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for the response. There's a question from Agence France Presse, AFP. Antonio uh, is asking, what is the impact of the shark's net and the drum lines throughout the country on the other sharks, smaller sharks that the white sharks are feeding off? Hi. Um, so the question being, what's the impact of the KwaZulu Natal shark nets mm -hmm. in context of and drum lines and drum lines yes. in context of threats? Yes. Um, I think everybody's looked at Charlene's graph, and the NPOA does take into consideration um, bathe safety me measures, which harvest shark uh, well, not harvest them, but are involved in removal of animals from the ecosystem. And within the context of actual directed shark fisheries, the Natal shark sport catches are minimal in comparison. So as far as the uh, categorization as threat, uh, it still falls lower down the scale than fisheries. Okay. The next question from Dave van Binnigen. And Dave says, uh, in terms of uh, section, in terms of the 62 actions of the current NPO, uh, sorry, NPOA, Shucks, in terms of their feasibility and their implementation status, have you found that the original uh, NPOA recommendations have been implemented and produced positive outcomes? Or have there been unforeseen challenges in terms of their implementation? Yeah, I think it was quite clear that uh, some of um, the 62 actions uh, have been implemented, they have been followed, and they have been completed. And as the minister and my colleagues have alluded to, um, the foundational areas in this plan, that's on the taxonomy, basically on the accounting, which kind of species do we have in South Africa, what is their status, also where are they. So these areas we have done fairly well, and then um, I think our struggle is to take the scientific information and translate it if, if effectively into management. Right? So if you go down the list of recommendations, that is really at the, at the core of the recommendations of, of the panel. Thank you. Um, Ronel Friend asks, from the limited data presented today, it seems that the two OCAS, Porsche, Port, rather, Port and Starboard, have a significant and huge impact on white sharks, both on their existence and the ecotourism in the Western Cape. What interventions are you envisaging? Did you discuss any actions that can be taken against these orcas? Since their impact on the white sharks now seem higher than the total impact from the fisheries in SA. Please don't kill the orcas, <laughs> or I'll put the whaling community onto you. <laughs> <laughs> I think what one of the interventions we can do is to um, satellite tag these orcas, for example, find out their movements, more about them, 
do some uh, limited invasive research where you can actually take some tissue samples from these orcas and that can tell you what they're eating, how much they're eating um, using a method called stable isotopes. Um, I think we're at that stage where we really need to learn more. And in fact, I woke up this morning to a message that Port and Starboard were seen in Langebaan yesterday. So they might be on their way to Cape Town at this very moment. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we've got one question from the floor. Gentleman over there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pedro Garcia. I'm with the South African United Fishing Front, and we deal with small scale fishes. I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we were part of your virtual group as well. Uh, when the um, recommendations came through in terms of the communications, uh, we fully agree with that. We don't have a problem. But Minister, I also want to bring to your attention that the consultative processes has been, has been really dismal from government side as far as communities go. And if we want to address the issues that this group has recommended, then it is our belief that the, the challenge of proper consultative processes, which takes local dynamics into account, must be addressed first. Because it's pointless going into a community with the type of recommendations we are talking about, and you're talking above the communities. Local dynamics must be taken into account. We're missing this point every time with every consultation process that takes place in fishing communities. So uh, that is from our side. I just want to say that, that when the, the term sanctuary was raised here today, of course, the red flags went up everywhere. Sanctuaries also implies something similar to an MP. And I think you've answered that question as well, Minister, um, in terms of using certain references for what should be, especially when you have multi-stakeholders in various areas that, or, or use, uh, user groups. So I just want to also just leave uh, this meeting with one question in terms of communication, because I think that some of the parties here are involved in the Isimango Liso um, dispute which has taken place at the moment. There's a perfect example of what had happened in Isimangaliso in terms of the, the uh, local communities not being uh, informed of the engagements which had taken place. Is this being resolved? Is this being sorted out? Um, maybe one of you can answer that question. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Pedro, it's hard to keep track of you. Uh, last week you were in Ilans Bay, Bay. This week you're in Isimangali. So uh, maybe at some stage I must understand what organization uh, you represent so that I can understand the scope and the mandate of that organization. But I know that you will give me plenty of advice on social media that will keep me on my toes. And of course, I'm very grateful for all that advice. And we will continue to translate, because I think that the, the essence and the importance of the point that you're making is that a scientific gathering such as this is appropriate when we address the scientific community. But when we go to communities on the ground, we must be clear about the specific implementation mechanism that we would want to introduce so that those communities are able to respond in terms of their own material interests. And I think that that's a, a very important point you're making, and it's why I emphasized, as you have said, that there, there's no such thing as a sanctuary. There's something called a marine protected area, and that involves a, a significant regulatory framework and significant consultation. But you're absolutely right. When we want to take specific decisions, those decisions have to be translated from scientific language into interest group issues 
so that people can be properly consulted and so that they can fully understand the intended and unintended consequences of what we're talking about. So we take that point, and I think that it remains valid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'm not sure if there are still any further questions from the floor. I take it that uh, all of the online responses have uh, sought to also address some of the questions you may have had, and uh, we've responded to all of the questions. Um, I think we've come to the end of this program. Minister, thank you so much for, for making time to, to, to receive this report, but also share it with South Africans. Um, different stakeholders that are here today, thank you so much for, to those of you who were part of the sessions um, that gathered information that ultimately gave birth to the report that we've given to Minister. Members of the panel, a million humble DEFF thanks for having been part of this uh, historical um, report, historical also because uh, I'm sure that uh, for some students somewhere at the university, this is going to form part of their research work. And thanks to everyone for having joined us, uh, colleagues from the fisheries management branch for having organized this, our stakeholders, uh, Sanbi, Sandparks, and all the different key players who, are, who continue to make our work relevant, but also who continue to make sure that we continue to live in harmony with our environment. Thank you so much, and thanks, Minister. That's how we come to the session.